<laughs> it's like a little wet. You can still abuse this car. Look at that, a little bit of rotation mid corner. Welcome back, I'm Tedward, and today, now that my 2022 Honda Civic Si is broken in with about 1,500 miles, we can start redlining it. And if you don't know, I replaced my 2010 E92 M3 with this car. And don't worry, I'm fully aware this is not a one-to-one -one replacement for an M3. Except those of you who do know, I also own an E39 M5 and a 1988 air-cooled 911. The M3 played a weird role in my life because while it was my daily driver, it was also plenty capable on track and as a fun canyon carver. It also served as sort of a GT car. So at the end of the day, it made it really difficult to choose the 911 or the M5 because the M3 did almost all of the things those cars do fairly well. So one of the reasons that went into buying this Civic Si was to dissuade me from using it on the weekends. I want to use my M5 and 911 more. And if I bought another car that served as a track car, daily driver, grand tour, and all those things, then I probably still just wouldn't use my other cars. This has been doing me very well though, because it is such a little fuel sipper, but it's also incredibly fun to drive. So some quick stats, it has 200 horsepower from its 1.5 liter turbo four cylinder. It, I've been getting 37.6 miles per gallon over the course of 1500 miles. Now, it does take premium fuel. It says it can run on 87, which is regular where I'm from, and it's recommended that you run 91, except for the fact that in Massachusetts, 91 is very difficult to come by. Almost any premium fuel is going to be 93, so I still end up paying maybe 10 or 15 cents more than what I could get if I can find 91. Not a huge deal, but what is a huge deal is the practicality of this car. One of the things that I'm really happy about is having a four-door daily driver, because I'm somebody who always brings camera bags, and backpacks and I really hate having to move the seat of a coupe forward every time you want to put stuff in. I don't use the trunk that often. So I do love being able to just open this door, put my backpack down, throw some stuff on the back seat and we're good to go. There's also really nice roomy legroom back here. This is currently set at my driving position. This really is the size of an Accord at this point. This 11th generation Civic is not a small car like you usually think of a Civic. And there's just enough creature comforts to feel comfortable. Like you could put people in this car and drive a reasonable distance. There's also plenty of headroom. And for the first time I'm realizing that there is a light that I did not realize I could have on. Okay, so now we have that set to door. Good job, Tom. But I know you're not actually interested in rear legroom. You are interested in what it's like to drive. And now that it's broken in and we can start putting some revs against this motor, we can experience it to its full potential. Gotta love that little SI welcome screen. Now, one of the things the Canadian users will see is that we don't get the better display. We don't get the heated seats. We don't get the heated steering wheel. Such a bummer. But I got to tell you, having spent a lot of time with this car already over the last couple of weeks, I have just enjoyed it significantly. There are a couple of things that drive me nuts, though. Number one, I do love that I have Apple CarPlay and that it's wireless. This is not currently plugged in. It does not charge wirelessly, however, so it will just connect to my phone and do the thing. The thing that annoys me, here's the thing that annoys me, is that I want to go to FM. Let's say I just want to listen to the radio. It'll instantly connect back to Apple CarPlay. Like, I cannot change the audio source if you're watching this. FM, back to Apple CarPlay, back to Apple CarPlay. And that's really annoying, which means that I'm going to have to go into my phone and turn off Wi-Fi and Bluetooth to try to make that work. So kind of annoying. But what I do like is that even though this is sort of attacked on screen, it's very easy to navigate the things that I want to see, which most of the time is my trip computer where I can see my previous MPG on the previous trip and my range. I just filled this a minute ago. 427 miles. This is insane. It has like a 12.6 gallon tank, maybe 12.4. I forget. I'll fact check it down below. But either way, that's bonkers because at 37 or 38 miles per gallon, that's actually like a 450 mile range. This is cutting me short so I don't run out of gas. That is nuts. And I got to say, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you like muscle cars or big Hellcat fuel burning V8s. 
it's nice to not have to spend that much in fuel when you're doing activities that you don't even want to do. You're going to the grocery store, you're going to work, you're commuting. Like, why do I want to get 19 miles per gallon when I don't even want to be in my car? And this is doing that really well. Now, this is the newest car I've ever owned. Obviously, it's brand new. But what I'm saying is I've never owned a car that was this current that was like less than a few years old. And that means... I have a backup camera for the first time. You have a couple different angles you can look at, which is actually really helpful because I'm like learning to navigate this thing. And one of the weirdest things to me about new cars is that like there really isn't much visibility out of the back. I am one of these guys. That's how I reverse a car. I have had to adapt and learn to use that reverse camera a bit more than I anticipated. And driving a manual as a daily driver sometimes seems like a huge pain to people because you know you're having to do a little extra footwork you're having to do the thing I always find this a lot more controlled and enjoyable to have a manual car gonna say it's kind of an entertaining rev limiter there's a little bit of rev hang up top but it's not egregious you could tune that out i probably won't because i don't really need to do anything to this car like if it had more power i don't think it would be more entertaining to me i you know like i'm okay with this being a low power car i have accepted that i'm not trying to race anybody that does not matter to me <laughs> what does matter to me though is handling and that is what this does really well that's a little bit stiff it's not too stiff though and honestly I think for some people coming from maybe like a, a very normal car it would be too stiff it might like bounce you around a little bit for me though coming from an M3 which is a fairly stiff vehicle this just doesn't intimidate at all in terms of stiffness. Like this is totally fine. This is appropriate for me on the road and on the highway. My God, we could do that Tesla jump right here. This is a proper set of train tracks. A little bit of torque steer. Not a lot though, it just kind of tightens up that steering. So you're just gonna be aware of it and make sure that you're, you're pointing the direction you'd like to go. <laughs> it is entertaining. It's just a joy to drive. How about these brakes? They are fine. I think they communicate really well. I get good feedback from the pedal. It's easy for me to modulate. I would like stickier tires. There's always a little dramatic getting into these brakes. Um, but that's fine. That's something I am probably going to do this summer. I would like to put a stickier tire on it for a couple reasons. You know, I definitely want to quiet the car down a little bit on the highway. The road noise is mildly unacceptable, but it's not, it's not so bad that I can't deal with it. I just would prefer not to. And a sticky tire is always gonna improve safety, in my opinion, because it's going to reduce stopping distances. So you'll notice it doesn't quite rev out like an 8th gen Civic. And I think this is the best SI since the 8th gen. The 9th and 10th gen were fine, but they didn't quite hit the mark for me. And I've gotta say, this is like a really refreshing thing to be driving, despite not having some 8,000 RPM redline four-cylinder, because those were really entertaining. But you know what? We understand, like those aren't coming back. That's a thing of the past. And I think what they've done, although this engine is fun and easy to flog, this chassis is just so good at carving low speed corners. This isn't gonna be your high speed GT car at like 120 miles an hour on a racetrack, but what it does do really well is it just slams side to side into corners because it weighs 2,900 pounds and it makes the most of that little bit of weight. 
Now, I have the auto rev matching feature on right now, mostly because I've been lazy, but I like it. It's actually pretty good. Auto start stop. I have a lot of thoughts about this. I, this is the first car I've ever owned with an auto start stop, like to save fuel while you're at idle. A little bit of rev hang, but it allows you to be patient. We'll get into that later. But the auto start stop feature, right? This is a turbo. I grew up in a world where people tune their turbo cars and they add turbo timers to them. So that way, anytime you, you stop your car, you turn off that engine, you're gonna let the car run for a minute to cool down. It seems very odd to me that I would have an auto start stop on a turbo car because basically like I'm going out, I'm ringing it out and then I come to a stop and instead of letting it idle and, and come back down, I'm just turning it off. Like that can't be good for it, right? Like that can't be good for it. Good doggy, hello. Yeah, oh, big yawn. All right, if we swap it to sport mode, you wait up the steering a little bit, it turns off the auto start stop, and we end up with fake engine noises. You can hear that now, right? So it's not the most pleasant sound, but I get the point of it. Hear that? Now we'll go back to normal mode. And it kind of slowly went away. It actually took a second for that to go away. And now that's gone. All right, I'm gonna stop being obnoxious on the throttle. But, you know, sport mode, it stiffens up the steering a little bit. It gives you that extra noise. I think it sharpens up the throttle response. I don't think much more really happens. I mean, I don't think sport mode adds any sort of like over boost function. The car doesn't feel any faster. It's negligible. But the thing I like about this car is all the mechanical things about it because it's very simple. But one of the most beautiful things about this car is this limited slip differential. The rev hang is not as egregious as I was anticipating. Frankly, I find it actually nice in a daily driver. If this was like my track car, my sports car, that kind of thing, that might get a little annoying to me, but it means that I don't have to like rush shifts. I get to be kind of lazy. And for the reasons I bought this car, I kind of prefer to be a little lazy. So it's not fast, but it's fast enough. And what's amazing is how it puts power down. Like, obviously you're not gonna be spinning the wheels with 200 horsepower, but in a corner, it is able to grip and like grapple hook you. It feels like it's putting power to that outside wheel, you know, and, 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 it, and it just like rockets you around. It's really fascinating. All right, out here on the highway. This is where things get interesting. There's a lot of road noise. I have the all seasons. I didn't get the uh, the high performance summers, which would have been nice, would have been nice, and those probably would be quieter, but I am gonna put a quieter tire on this because this is not a particularly well insulated cabin, and maybe that's a sacrifice that I just need to make for a car that weighs 2,900 pounds. That's fine, I can deal with that. We've got radar guided cruise control. It's a little conservative, like I have it set to the closest possible setting and it still puts me really far away from cars. But another feature it has is this little guy. It's not just a simple lane keep assist. It actually is in the lowest possible form, like a little bit of self-driving. It's steering in the lane for me. It can't do crazy things. It's not gonna be like a Tesla autopilot where it's gonna rocket you around a corner, a tight, tight corner. But what it does do is it takes a little bit of the pressure off. If you were on a long drive and you just didn't wanna be bothered, like having to deal with that. Or, you know, God forbid you're texting or doing something you shouldn't be doing in your car. It is a little nice to have something that can handle that for you. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's not the most amazing system. It's just based, I believe, off a camera in this. And, you know, it only works if it can see the lines and, you know, we'll see how it navigates this, right? 
How are you doing? Okay. Steering required. We put a little effort into it. It cannot change lanes. So if I put my blinker on, it simply disables it. I move over and we are back. But I don't find myself using it that much, but I do think it's relatively convenient. And on a car at this price point that's under $30,000, I'm pretty happy with this. I am I am satisfied. I'm not impressed, I am satisfied. And that's not a terrible place to be. The cancel button. The cancel button only cancels the radar guided cruise control. Let's get back over. It does not cancel the, the lane keep assist. So that's annoying. I wanna hit cancel and I wanna kill all of this, but the car is still steering itself. So I've gotta hit this button again. I wish that wasn't the case. I would like the cancel button to just cancel any type of assistance in one go. I don't want to have to think about that. This is where it shines though. It's this mid corner balance and applying throttle in the corner. It's amazing how it does this. Like there's virtually no understeer. And that tail comes around so nicely. It's amazing. There's a little bit of rotation that happens that's not scary. It's very progressive. It's a very happy car. This is what's great. You can just kind of stay flat mid corner just pulls you around like very little understeer on throttle a little bit of rev hang there these tires don't have a ton of grip but you can kind of play with the rotation with a little dab of brakes and a little bit of throttle and it's just so entertaining Like a little wet, you can still abuse this car. Look at that, a little bit of rotation mid corner. You can find it with the brakes. If there's any understeer, you just add a little bit. There's a little bit of drama to the sound. Don't be put off by that. These are just really loud all seasons. But I just find this to be such an outrageous experience. Get on that throttle, it just pulls you back in, it just sucks you back in, it's amazing. I love the way this works. We'll come a little wide so we can turn back in for this. Look at that, back on throttle, and it just rockets you. Look at that, look at that, it's so much fun. You know, I didn't think I would be wanting to bring this car on a racetrack as much as I do, but like, I actually think it's more capable than I was giving it credit for. And it's wonderful. This is just so wonderful to toss into a corner. I need a little more brakes. I think I would put a, a better brake pad on this car. And that's maybe as far as I would take it. Uh, as far, and tires, you know, it needs tires. But that's the thing, man. I am just blown away at the capability of this thing. I'm blown away at how entertaining it is to drive. And uh, yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna let like, oh, it's just a Civic be a part of my experience here. Because this is just incredible what you can do balancing this car and then just shut it all down. And no one's the wiser. They just think, oh, it's just a Civic with a little spoiler. I gotta tell you, this is more fun on a back road than my M3 because if I was pulling this kind of stuff in my M3, you're going a lot faster, you're not able to really put it on that knife's edge without being a little more ridiculous, like genuinely ridiculous. And I feel like you can do things in this car that are incredibly entertaining and not ridiculous. We also got to talk about front wheel drive. I know there's people that wrote like, I can't believe you, how dare you buy a front wheel drive car. There is nothing sporty about front wheel drive. Well guys, if that is the way you feel, it is simply because you are not driving 
hard enough or you don't understand the dynamics. Like to to properly drive anything, right? Whether it's rear wheel drive, all wheel drive, front wheel drive, there are different driving techniques involved. And, and in my line of work where A, I wanna be able to drive all of the things and B, I wanna be really fast at driving all of the things. I love being able to kind of rotate this car mid corner. I love being able to correct for things and know exactly what I need to do. And that also goes for my 911, right? My, my Porsche, it's rear engine. It took me a little time to kind of adjust to that. Like I know what I'm supposed to do in that car, but you know, you need to be getting used to something. You need to have that in your life a little bit to really hone it in and hone that skill. And for me, I hadn't had a front wheel drive in car in so long that sure, I will go out and drive some front wheel drive cars for reviews, but like I might not push them as hard because I might not be quite as comfortable as I am in my M3 or my M5 or my 911. Now I feel like I have a lot more comfort level in, in, in a front wheel drive chassis and knowing instinctively exactly what to do in every scenario when I've let it go a little, I let that tail go out a little too hard or whatever. Like this is genuinely fun. So I must say, I've been having a lot of guilt-free fun in my car, even when I'm being really abusive to it. We're still getting 26 miles per gallon, which is pretty stunning. And I'm gonna reel that back in on my drive home for sure. And we'll we'll get it above 30, no questions asked. So this is the kind of the first of many of my first ownership thoughts of my Civic Si. Now that it's properly worn in, we can rev it out, we can abuse it a little bit. And you know, I'm 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 not regretting my decision. I, I feel like I'm gonna have so much fun in this car. I've already lowered my stress levels. My buddy Eddie, who I do the podcast with all the time, he's already told me every time he calls me that I sound better, I sound healthier, I sound like a better, happier person because I'm not worried about what's next on the M3 or there's not a new vibration that I'm troubleshooting or a, a leak or a drip or a thing. You know, I've just had so many issues owning a 110,000 mile M3 that it was time for a change, time for a reliable change. Please don't do this little squirrel. Okay, good boy. See, we're competing with nature. We're using less fuel, we're saving squirrels. And I know that a lot of folks in the comments had a lot to say about me changing my, my garage up like this. But I will tell you, go, you know, do I miss my M3? Yes, but I miss it in its prime. I miss it as like a 40 to 75,000 mile car. I do not miss that as a 100,000 mile car. There's a big difference. There really is. And that was me even maintaining it pretty religiously. So it's just the way it goes. It's just the way things are. And uh, I think it was time to just reset, reset, not worry all the time and have something that's gonna get me there every day. It's always gonna start. I'm not gonna be wondering what's that noise and will it cost me $2,500? So thank you so much for watching, liking, commenting, and subscribing. Don't forget to respect the drive. And I'll see you in the next one. Check, 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 check. People don't seem to know what to do when the answer is just pull to the right, but okay.